Registrations are now open for the 6th Bioceuticals Research Symposium to be held in Melbourne on the 27th to the 29th of April 2018. To register, please go to bioceuticals.com.au and click on the Education tab. FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining me on the line today, all the way from Cape Town, South Africa, is Professor Tim Noakes. Now, Professor Noakes studied at the University of Cape Town, UCT, obtaining his medical degree and then a Doctor of Science in Exercise Science, an award that's only given once every five years, as I understand it. He is now an Emeritus Professor at UCT following his retirement from the Research Unit of Exercise Science and Sports Medicine. In 1995, he was a co-founder of the now prestigious Sports Science Institute of South Africa. He's been rated an A1 scientist by the National Research Foundation of South Africa for a second five-year term. In 2008, he received the order of, I hope I pronounced this right, Mapungubwe. Is that correct? Silver Very good. from That's the amazing. president of South Africa. <laughs> for his excellent contribution to the fields of sports and science of physical exercise. I could go on and on with the amount of work that you've done, the amount of papers you've written. You've got an H index of 71. You're an award-winning author. I welcome you. We're going to talk about sports science. We're going to talk about sports medicine and low-carb, high-fat diets. Welcome, Professor Tim Noakes to FX Medicine. How are you? Very well, thank you, Andrew. Privileged to be on your show. Thank you for hosting me. It, it is our honour. I've got to say, when I was looking through a few of the books that you've written, one stuck out to me, Waterlogged, The Serious Problem of yes. Overhydration in Endurance Sports. Can you first take our listeners on a little bit about this before we delve into our subject, please? Sure. I started running in 1969, ran my first marathon in 1972. And in those days, it was thought that uh, if you drank during exercise, you were a weakling. And the rules, in fact, almost forbade any drinking during marathon running. And so because I thought that was pretty wrong, we started a campaign to encourage drinking. And the campaign in South Africa was so successful that by 1981, we have this Comrades Marathon, which is a 56-mile race. We had seconding stations or drinking stations every mile. So going from nothing to 56 aid stations happened in a period of nine years. The problem is that in 1981, in the very first race, when they had so much fluid available, a lady became unconscious during the race, and oh. she almost died. She was unconscious for four days right. after the race. And she wrote to me and asked me what happened, and I said, I have no idea. And I then went and interviewed some other people who'd got a similar problem and worked on it for about three years and published a paper saying that it was over-drinking that it caused the problem. So this was the complete reverse because everyone had said, well, she's obviously dehydrated. That's why she's unconscious. Yeah. And we were saying, no, it's because she was over-hydrated. Wow. And then we, we did some research. By 1991, we proved that over-hydration is much more likely to kill you and underhydration. In oh. fact, under, there's never been a death from underhydration that has been reported in the literature that we're aware of right. in people running marathons. But there have been plenty of deaths. Not even with uh, causing rhabdo or anything? Yeah, no, because it's not related. You know, rhabdomyolysis oh. is caused by a genetic disorder, probably. Right. And there's something that activates it, but it's not dehydration, that's for sure. Wow. So... So we then started this campaign, and uh, it's still been poo-pooed. The guidelines still do not warn against the dangers of over-drinking during exercise. Mm. And that was because the sports drink industry came along. And at the very time that we were warning against over-drinking, the sports drink industry was taking off and saying, well, you must drink as much as possible. They were interested in selling more product. We were interested in save lives, saving lives. Now, Waterlogged is the story of that battle, which continues today. It has still not been won. 
So, so just moving on from that, I mean, obviously you've challenged the status quo throughout your whole professional career. Can you take us through a little bit of your history, how you became a doctor in the first place and why, and yeah. where your healthy levels of scepticism for long held beliefs, you know, nutritional guidelines um, stem from? Yeah, I, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do after I matriculated. I didn't know what I went to do. Fortunately, I went to America for a year and, and was an exchange student there. And during that time, Professor Christian Barnard performed the third, world's first yeah. successful human heart transplant yes. in Cape Town. And that stimulated me to want to study medicine. And so I then chose to do medicine, but it soon became apparent to me that I was more interested in the science than in the medical care. I still cannot prescribe a drug. I don't know how to prescribe any drugs. I managed to get to medicine <laughs> because I had, I had such an antithesis to the pharmacological model of disease mm. that I simply couldn't prescribe any drugs. So after I did my internship, I decided to go into science, and I've been in science ever since. And so I'm, I'm a, a trained doctor who who's much more interested in what causes disease than, than how you treat it. So that became my bias. And of course, I got into medical research in cardiology in 1976. Huh. In 1977, the US dietary guidelines came out telling us we must cut fat, cut, margi- cut butter, eat lots of margarine, eat lots of polyunsaturated fats, eat, eat lots of cereals and grains. And so I embraced this. And soon, without noticing that I put on weight on the diet, my running got worse. And after 33 years of following the advice, I got type 2 diabetes. Right. So then, despite the fact that I'd run all these marathons and things and been physically active. So I had a moment, a Damascene moment, when I read Jeff Olick and Eric Westman's book called uh, The New Atkins for the New Year. And that turned my life because within 20 minutes, or so two hours of reading it, I said, oh my gosh. I got it completely wrong. And the advice I've been giving people to eat high carbohydrate diets, I could see was damaging. Mm. So that was my moment. And then since then, for the last five or six years, I've been trying to promote a bit more balance in dietary advice. And particularly saying that if you're insulin resistant, you cannot eat a high carbohydrate diet because it will cause you to develop type 2 diabetes in the long term, probably cancer, perhaps dementia, certainly hypertension, and as I've indicated, obesity and type 2 diabetes. So that's the the way I got there. And it's been tough because I've been ostracized by my profession yes. for, for making these plans. But, um, but the funny thing is, like, for instance, coming from Australia, you know, the good old Aussie research, yeah. you know, we follow those guidelines as well, the, the high um, omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids, PUFAs, and... Sure. Um, they were totally undone with the Sydney Diet Heart Study that pulled, called exactly. into question this advice from extremely good data. And yet the exactly. guidelines changed? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you know, there is some suggestion that the guidelines have actually changed. And it's really funny because there is a paper in the Journal of American Medical Association written by David Ludwig, who's a good friend of mine, yeah. in which he says, he describes it unnoticed to all of us the 2015 guidelines put no limit on the amount of fat you can eat in your diet. Now, when people then, he wrote that in and it's published, and I've quoted it, but when you actually phone the people who drew up the guidelines, whichever organization it is, they say, no, 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 and then they give you this long story about actually we haven't changed. Yeah. So I'm not clear whether the guidelines have changed, but if they don't put a limit on fat intake, then all this whole story for the last 33 years they've acknowledged is wrong. Mm. And we can just go back to eating what we did in the 1960s. And this is, this is something that really interests me, you know, like the old, um, like grandma used to make, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> of course, that was before multi-billion dollar indus- food industries became a, yeah. a, the juggernauts that they are. But just speaking briefly about your ostracization, if that is a word at all, yeah. um, by your, your brethren, You've indeed won a landmark case recently. That's correct. So, so I became active on Twitter about about four years ago and didn't have a clue what it was all about and started tweeting. And so a lot of people liked what I did, so they followed me. Yeah. 
And then the one mother, she did not ask for medical advice. This is a key point. She asked a wee question. She said, should moms and babies? And I then responded to that. Mm. And then the dietitians took exception to what I'd said, and they assumed that I was saying telling mothers not to breastfeed, which is not true. And they thought I was prescribing a ketogenic zero carbohydrate diet, which of course I wasn't because mm. they didn't bother to read mm. any of the stuff I've written. Mm. And then this case went before the professional counsel to whom I'm answerable, and they decided to prosecute me despite the fact that they broke all their rules, all their principles. And over a three year period, we were in court for 25 days. So for 25 days, over three years, but this thing was debated, and we presented 12 days of testimony, including three expert witnesses from overseas. Mm. And in the end, they, we won on all points. We, there were 10 decisions, and we won all 10 of them. So, so that was hopefully the end of that. But it, it, and although the committee did not say that the low carbohydrate diet was the choice for everyone, they did say that it was logically based that there was a logical basis for it, and we had presented that for 12 days. Hmm. So that's a real advance, and because I was accused of giving unconventional advice, i.e. not evidence-based. Yeah. And they said, no, it is logical. What he argued is logical. Therefore, it is evidence-based. Yeah. So I have to ask, a, it's more of a rhetorical question, I guess, but given that baby formula uh, um, has only been in existence since what 1966 when Wyeth I think it was Tomarelli um, and from the Wyeth Institute uh, did the work with regards yeah. to casein and um, putting weight on babies what did the eons of generations of humans before the 1960s yeah. do with regards to raising infants how did they feed their infants yeah, they fed them on bone marrow and liver and chewed meat. That, that's if you go back uh, 100,000, 200,000 years. Mm. That's what they would have ate. How did we survive? That's what they would... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they, they had to, and that was part of my argument when I was first challenged. I said, but hold on. You know, we've been eating this way for 4 million years. If, we didn't, yeah. if it didn't work, we wouldn't be here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah. So I guess in part, at least, we're referring to the low-carb, high-fat diets. Some know this as banting. Is that right? No, I'm not familiar with this. Yes. That, that was where we, the, real, the real trouble started. We wrote a book called The Real Meal Revolution, and it was published in December, November 2013, and it went viral in this country. And it sold 250,000 copies, which is for South Africa is massive. I mean, mm. it's just... You know, it's almost the top seller, one of the top sellers of all time. And it it inspired so much change. For example, there's a Banting Facebook page in Cape Town, which has 6,300, sorry, 630,000 people, 630,000 people. Mm. And it started two years ago. Now, the major wow. political parties do not have Facebooks with that many people no. <laughs> signed up. So that site went viral, and, and one of the problems was I think the dietitians may have suffered a little bit because people were reading the book and following the advice and finding it worked for some, for mm. many, and they figured that the advice they'd previously been given didn't work, and here all they had to do was just cook this delicious food, and it got thin, and they started curing their diabetes and obesity. So the original throwback against me came from the dietitians, and I, I suspect it was that they were scared that their profession was at risk because of the huge change in what South Africans were doing and the way they were approaching their food and whether or not they wanted to take the advice from dietitians anymore. Now, actually, Atkins was a high-fat diet, and he discovered in the 1970s he wanted to lose weight, and he decided the only way he could do that was to develop ketosis yeah. because he recognized that ketosis took your hunger away. And then he read that a low-carbohydrate diet did that, and he experimented on himself. And he found it was a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet that worked for him. And in his book, he absolutely describes that the key is how much fat is in the diet. Mm. So, it, no, once, you, once you cut carbohydrates, by and large, you'll have to eat a high-fat diet. Right. And it doesn't mean that you're eating fat all the time. It just means that because fat's so energy-dense, if you eat 
protein containing foods, animal produce, you generally will have a higher fat content than a protein content. Yeah. So the diet just becomes a higher fat diet. How then does this um, mesh in with or ratify with the Mediterranean diet, the holy grail of diets for healthy longevity? Yeah. And Well, I don't believe that story because the Mediterranean diet is, a, is an even higher fat diet. It's the true uh-huh. Mediterranean diet is a high fat diet. Right. And of course it contains olive oil, but we don't know whether it's olive oil that's being healthy or, or the high fat, the high cheese, the high dairy, the high other things. But the medical Mediterranean diet has been developed, which contains grains, cereals and that's grains, pasta, yeah. And, yeah. And, and olive oil. And it, it's not the true Mediterranean diet. No, I think that's what's happened is... A truism has been bastardized by what we now know and um, by convenience, not the least, but also the high carb sort of guidelines. We tend to sort of change them exactly. to suit the, yeah. Exactly. It's, it's what they're saying is, oh, you can eat more fat. Yeah, we, but it's got to be healthy fat. It's got to be olive oil. It can't be dairy. It's got to be olive oil. And But you must still have your grains because they provide fiber, yeah, yeah, yeah. for which is absolutely no evidence. So the, the Mediterranean diet, and it works a little bit. And in fact, in the clinical trials, it is so ineffective that you have to treat 60 people for one to benefit. Right. So to me, and unfortunately, that's a published study, and no one ever recognizes that, that the benefit was trivial. Oh, okay. And then they conflate it, and they say, oh, but it's a 30% reduction in heart attack risk. But that's called, a, that's a, a not an absolute, that's a relative reduction. The right. absolute reduction was one in 60 people benefited. And that's the so it was it's been mythologized as right. being proven to be beneficial. And of course it's beneficial because you're eating more fat. But why not go the whole hog and take take a sixty or seventy percent fat diet and see what happens with that? Right. Then you'll see real benefits occurring. Not one in sixty six sixty people benefiting, but one in two benefiting. That's what you'll find. Right. Because right. one in two of us is insulin resistant, and those are people who are going to really benefit from this diet. Gotcha. I can't, I've got to say, I can't wait for this uh, podcast to be published. I'm going to co- do a call out to Dr. Z Shanarain <laughs> in Australia, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Z, because he does a lot of um, high fat, low carb, and he's a runner. Um, and oh, it, the the changes in his physique are just amazing over the time that he instituted yeah. the diet for himself. So let's go on further. One of the things that you do with the Noakes Foundation is support research into low carb, high fat. What evidence already That's exists, correct. and what research are you currently doing or looking to do in the future? Okay, I wrote a review with a colleague, and it was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine earlier this year on the low low carb diets and you know are they beneficial and it's a review which has been downloaded 30,000 times it's one of the most downloaded articles it be, it was put on a medical website in America became the most downloaded article there wow. and this just gives a balanced view and the balanced view is that if you are insulin resistant and you cannot tolerate carbohydrates you will develop all the conditions that we talk about obesity, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, I suspect, and uh, Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. I think they're all related to this condition of insulin resistance. So our argument is that the most prevalent medical condition in the world is insulin resistance, but we don't teach it at medical schools. And insulin resistance by itself is benign, but it becomes toxic when you eat a high-carbohydrate diet. So all we're saying is if you have any of the manifestations of insulin resistance, you will do incredibly well by reducing your carbohydrate content. And if you have type 2 diabetes, we know now, and the proof is going to be out in, in a few months' time, in December certainly, that the majority of type 2 diabetics, once they cut their carbohydrates to below 25 grams a day, can reverse their condition without requiring continued insulin use. Hmm. So, so that's the evidence. The evidence is that, that carbohydrates have a special role in causing ill health in people who are insulin resistant. Mm. And that is, turns out the majority of us, once we turn 50 or 60, most of us are insulin resistant. Right. So that's the argument. Now, we're funding research to look at what happens when you take diabetics and you put them on a high-fat diet. Why do they reverse their type 2 diabetes? And we're looking specifically at all the possible changes in the physiology that could occur. 
And we're particularly interested in what happens to the heart because many people say, oh, you see, you go on this diet, but your cholesterol goes up. We want to know, well, does that put you at increased risk of heart attack? Does it cause arterial damage? So that that's the one question. The other question is we're one of the few people who can measure liver glucose production. Right. And we have published a paper in Journal of Physiology last year showing that we measured it in healthy humans on the high-fat diet. And that's a key driver in diabetes. Once your liver glucose production is uncontrolled, you have type 2 diabetes. Yep. And one of the key questions is how do you reverse that? And we know, we, we're almost certain that that's the key thing that will change. Your, your liver will suddenly become responsive to insulin and you won't over-secrete glucose. And then then that produces a cascade of changes that make you renormalize your your diabetes. So that's what we that's what our funding is going towards to research that. Just to make the point that we're not trying to prove that diabetes is reversible with type two diabetes because those studies are currently being done in California. Right. The first paper came out a few months ago. It's from an organization called Verta Health. And they showed H high, glycated hemoglobin values coming down nicely within 10 weeks of being on the diet. A lot of people cutting their insulin or reducing or stopping their insulin and many stopping medication. Those data are now at a year and a half. In other words, the trial has gone a year and a half and the one-year data will be published in December and the results are spectacular. Now, the reason why this is a spectacular study is because they've got 90% compliance with the diet, and that's the key. Right. A lot of the criticism of the low-carbohydrate diet not working is because people don't really comply. Yeah. They eat a low-carbohydrate diet for three months, and then when the, just before the trial ends at six months, they're back eating a high-carbohydrate diet again. Right. right. And, and what this study shows is if you comply, you can reverse type 2 diabetes. Of course, it's not gone into remission. It's gone into remission. You are cured. You will just go straight back to type two diabetes if you increase your carbohydrate intake. Yeah, and and this is the strongest possible evidence that carbohydrates are driving the problem, and that we can't continue as the Australian Diabetes Association does. We can't continue telling diabetics to eat high carbohydrate diets no, really for whatever reason. Yeah. That's not the right advice. No, even even even. You know, reasonably orthodox, dare I say that word, um, nutritionists like Professor Jenny Brand Miller of the Glycemic Index fame states yeah. that, you know, the previous guidelines simply have not worked. So, so whatever your argument, whatever their, you know, belief of what yeah. the causation is, we know that what has gone before has not worked. You know, we need to change. I've got 20 questions yeah. going on from what you've just spoken about now. <laughs> so I think the first one is please settle this in my mind because I'm, I'm rather confused about it. Looking at the work um, from Jeff Leach when he went to live with the Hudza tribe and he looked at their, he was looking at um, uh, manipulating the microbiota, diversifying his own mm. Western microbiota to that of the Hudza tribe who move with the herds, they don't, they don't have a home, if you like, they move along the plains with mm. the food. But it's said that depending on the season, they eat a massive amount of carbohydrates, indeed a massive amount of even fructose. They eat honey, up to 30% of their intake, yet they have almost non-existent diabetes. How do you mm. ratify that sort of finding with our convenient lifestyle of Western, where, for instance, I'm, I've been sitting down all day doing podcasts? Sure. Is that the issue that we need to move more? No, I'm not sure about moving. <laughs> You're right, okay. You can't have done a bad diet. I think it's the whole culture. But firstly, they're insulin sensitive. That's one of the keys. And we become insulin resistant because we're born to mal if you're diabetic or eat a high carbohydrate diet. So there's a whole epigenetic effect. And then we're weaned onto high carbohydrate diets and highly refined carbohydrate diets, which those people aren't. And that's the first point. Is right. it's, our insulin resistance gets worse with age, and the more carbohydrates you're eating, the more it happens. So, you know, take a simple example. Mothers become insulin resistant during pregnancy, and they for a very good reason. The neonate, the infant, is, is insulin resistant for a very good reason. It needs to store fat so it can build a brain. But you, if you sustain the insulin resistance, you get type 2 diabetes in the long term. What you have to do is get rid of the high-carbohydrate diet, the insulin resistance reserve, reverses, and that person will have a normal, healthy life expectancy. So the hazard, they may well eat high-carbohydrate diets, but there are periods when they don't. 
Right. And that's when the insulin resistance will return back to normal. That's point one. And point two is they don't have an excess of calories. And number three, they don't eat much. Well, they have fructose, but most of the time they're not eating sugar. Yeah. And they're also not eating vegetable oil. So those are the components right. we think. Gotcha. It doesn't mean people can eat carbohydrates if you're insulin sensitive. But the problem is we fewer and fewer and fewer of us are carbohydrate sensitive. Yeah. We're, by and large, we're insulin resistant populations now. So we here we, you're talking about the the OB gene and the DB genes. Is that is that what we're talking about here? Uh, it may or may not be. I think it's. I think the, the the genes for diabetes are probably well described, or they should be. Yeah. And the more of those you have, the more insulin resistant you are. Yeah. The OB gene, I think, acts more on the in the appetite control centers in the brain. Right. And that's the other point. That's the, the apostat and. We are exposed to these addictive carbohydrates and addictive sugars, and that causes a long-term problem for us. So we become addicted to food. We eat every three hours, and our biology is simply not designed for that. We are not. We are designed to eat fat and metabolize it and burn it. Yeah. That's how we're designed. Yeah. We're not designed to be eating high carbohydrates and burning the carbohydrate all the time. We, we, that is not our evolutionary background, mm. and this, we can't cope, and that. The evidence is this diabetes, obesity outbreak. Yeah. Now, now you, you know, we've spoken about high fat. Obviously, fat is not one entity, mm -hmm. despite what some people tend to lump food groups into, like, you know, protein's all the same and fats are all the same mm -hmm. and carbs mm -hmm. are all the same. So when you've got high fats, <laughs> we've spoken about polyunsaturated fats. What about the other sorts of fats? What fats should we be consuming? I think most people don't understand that every single fat contains monopoly and mono and polyunsaturated fats yeah. and saturated fats. Hmm. They're all three in different combinations. And for example, an avocado, which is considered to be healthy, has more saturated fat than many saturated fats, sorry, many fats from animals. Hmm. But you're never told that, you hmm. see. So because the bias is that meat is bad and animal produce is bad because it contains saturated fat. But saturated fat is present in all fats that we eat from animals and from from other vegetable sources. And I'm not sure that we know. I think there is some evidence monounsaturated fats are healthy. We know we need omega-3 fatty acids from fish. And that's all I can say. I don't know that eating saturated fat, in other words, the, the food that really provide a lot of saturated fat are dairy. Hmm. And there's a paper out this week, and it is admittedly funded by the dairy board, but there's a meta-analysis meta showing that dairy has never been shown to be increase your risk of heart disease. So I can't say that eating saturated fat is worse for you than eating monounsaturated fats. But I do think I would look to the omega-3 fats from fish. I think fish has a special role. Yep. It may well be that monounsaturated fats are also healthy and that you just need to balance your saturated fats up with with more of those other fats from fish yep. and from avocados and from other some other vegetable sources. How do you address the issue with, you know, once a food becomes popular and quote-unquote healthy, like, for instance, fish, we now have a pressure on the industry to provide that fish to us to consume. And, of course, then the industry starts to say, well, we can't just fish these things out in the ocean. We're running out of space and we can't can't get them fast enough. So you know what we'll do? We'll farm them. And you know what we'll do then? We'll feed them soy. So yeah. what do you get when you when you have, you know, farmers under such pressure to provide um, the, the actual meat for our tables and yet so now they're under that pressure with regards to, you know, dry climates to then provide yeah. corn for them or hay for them. So how do we address yeah. this sort of issue? Where do you say to get your foods? I can only speak for cattle because I understand that cattle are not designed to eat maize and they die from it. That's why you have to kill them at a particular age right? because they're designed to digest grass. And, yes. And so they must be grass fed. I mean, you know, I, I haven't involved myself too much with that debate. And all I do is tell people, try to get grass fed animals. That, that's the key. They mm. must be eating what they're designed to eat. Mm. And we need to have a movement that provides that type of food. The reality is that we cannot provide this population that we have on Earth with continuing to increase grain production because that's just as unsustainable as trying to provide meat for everyone. Right. So there is going to be a, some problem sooner or later, and I don't know how it's going to be resolved. 
But my problem as a biologist is just to explain to people what they should be eating on the basis of our biology and our history. Yeah. Going into that biology and history, you've published a book called The Law of Running, and that's to do with our topic today, athletes and sports medicine. What are the benefits here and what can we learn from that book, The Law of Running? Well, I wrote The Law of Running, the last edition in 2002, and it needs a revision because it's highly carbohydrate-driven. Right. And, and, and when I wrote it, the, the teaching in sports science was that the, there's only one factor that determines your athletic performance, and that's how much carbohydrate you ate to the 36 hours before your event. Right. And of course, that's nonsensical, but that was driven by industry, and, and we didn't realize it, and I was part of that problem. And so that book's a problem because it, it tries to reduce all athletic performance to one variable, when of course you can't do that. There are many variables that determine performance, and the most important is the brain. So the revision that I will be writing will focus on the brain and rather than nutrition as the determinant of athletic performance. And it's really interesting, you know, because we, I was just watching and reading about this two-hour marathon event uh, a few last week, and the physiologist who were advising these Kenyan and Ethiopian runners you know, we're look, talking about physiology. No one talked about psychology. No one talked about uh, the brain. Yeah, They all were, how are you going to keep your oxygen cost down and how are you going to keep your glucose levels high? So it's still that model they've got, that it's all dependent on physiology. But that's not true. It's it's the psychology that and the mental approach that really determines performance. Mm. So, so the new book will be on that, but but my point is that I didn't. There's not enough discussion of the benefits of eating high fat diets in that book. Yeah, and that's what the revision has to has to show. Yeah, in a sense, the book is written for elite athletes. Two hour mar- sorry, the nutrition section is written for elite two hour marathon runners or guys running a mile in three minutes, whatever, for fifty seconds or something. Hmm. It's not for the average runner because the average runner struggles because they're insulin resistant and they're trying to eat a high carbohydrate diet and it doesn't work for them. Yeah. And they would benefit hugely by cutting the carbohydrates and eating much more fat. So with regards to preparation for somebody, you know, the typical weekend warrior, let's say, who mm. wants to start up running, like really getting into it. What mm. sort of time period, what sort of phase-in period do you suggest for changing their diet to a high-fat, low-carb diet and then getting the benefits of their running technique, I guess? Well, I, I definitely take 6 to 12 weeks to start to adapt properly to the diet. Mm-hmm. And I've just been in touch with a friend who I converted and who had a fabulous, he, he reduced his Ironman time by 4 minutes to 8 hours. So this is an 8-hour Ironman triathlete. Wow. He converted on the diet 18 weeks ago and then came forth in, a, in an international competition here. Oh, brilliant. Improving his time, running a 2.47 marathon at the finish. And and he said it took him 12 weeks to adapt. For the first 12 weeks, he was going nowhere and then suddenly he adapted. Yeah. And and a lot of the studies we have, the science is like three weeks or four weeks adaptation. It's far too short. Mm. So I think that people would really only start to show the real benefits six to 12 weeks. So you, if you're going to change, you have to understand that you can't change within three or four months of a major race. Yeah. And, and that's important. Yeah. I, I have to go back to something you mentioned earlier, and that was the compliance issue with a high-fat, low-carb diet. And, you know, it seems to be a real issue. How do you overcome that? How do you get people to stick to this diet and make it part of their life? Yeah, the compliance is everything because um, I haven't seen the data, but someone reported to me they're doing studies of ketone diets and using ketone bodies as well, and they they allowed a group to cheat. <laughs> yeah. They had one group who were 100% compliant, and the other group were allowed to cheat for two days a week on the on the low-carbohydrate, more ketogenic diet, so it was an even lower-carbohydrate diet. And the people who cheated didn't get the same benefits, and the reason was quite simple because they went out of ketosis. Mm for two days and it stayed on for another two days so they had four days of the oh. week they were actually on the high carbohydrate as if they were eating carbohydrates yeah yeah even though they were only eating carbohydrates two days a week and so they were only getting three days benefit a week and, and that's the problem that if you do eat carbohydrates you reverse the metabolism back for 24 hours 48 hours and so you lose any potential benefit I'm, I must say that uh, I've advised quite a lot of Australian 
uh, athletes, including David Pocock, your brilliant flanker yep. for the Wallabies. And he, he converted to the low-carb diet, but he says he for a big game and for training hard, he needs 150, 200 grams of carbs either the night before or the morning of the match, of the match international mm-hmm. game. Mm-hmm. So, But as soon as the game's over, he goes back to a full-on low-carb diet. And I think that's that's probably the way to do it if you're in, involved in an explosive sport like he is. Yeah. But we we normally say that you can't do explosive sport on the diet, but it's clear that you can. So so, but if you're going to do an event for three or four hours, you might as well just burn fat because that will give you all the energy you need, and you won't have to worry about carbs. What about the supposed exactly. time lag of access to fat as an energy source? Do you agree with that or not? No, that's a great question because we've actually studied it and published the work in the Journal of Physiology. And I couldn't believe it because we were taught traditionally that you have to get your fatty acid levels high mm. before you burn fat. So, And we knew you had to get, took time to get your fatty acid level high because they've got to be released from the fat tissue. What we showed in this study was the moment people started exercising on a high-fat diet, so in other words, these are people who had adapted for six months. Yeah. The instant they started exercise, they were burning fat at 1 to 1.2 grams per minute, which is huge. Ah. The average athlete who's eating a high-carbohydrate diet would start at half, oh, half, 0.3 to 0.5 grams per minute. So these people started right immediately at a very high rate of, carbo- or of fat oxidation. Mm. It doesn't take time to get in, to start. It's there the moment you start exercise. Okay. So then the reverse, when you're talking about, um, forgive me, I can't remember the footballer's name, who who started to have the carb load just on the day of the event. Yeah, David Pocock. Yeah. David Pocock. So how quickly would you fall out of ketosis and for what period after that? Okay, because he exercises so hard during the, the match, he will burn all his glycogen stores in his liver and his muscles. Right, so he's doing it. And right. he will go straight back into ketosis the moment, the moment he finishes the game, he'll already be ketotic again, yep. but at a low level. And then he won't eat carbohydrates, so he'll be ketotic for the rest of the day. Gotcha. And so in it, that would be, as long as you're doing enough um, energy expenditure on the day, burning up those carbs, then you won't fall out of ketosis, you'll remain in ketosis, and just you flow on from when you regain the diet. That's correct. Gotcha. That's correct. So the problem is if you eat lots of carbs and, and you're not doing the exercise, the vigorous exercise. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit about testing. How would a runner um, decide, how would they discover if they are insulin resistant? I remember speaking to um, Professor Robert Lustig about even you know, the gold standard test, which we talk about HbA1c, and he's yeah. saying, well, that's only looking at hemoglobin at the 1c level. There's glycogen residues at the lyse, sorry, um, lysine residues at the what was it, 65 and 110 um, uh, points we're, we're, that we're not measuring, and yet they're an indication of of uh, glycemic issues. So he's yeah, saying the, no. the problem is we haven't got access to this unless you're a researcher. So how do you know you're actually got good glycemic control or poor glycemic control? Yeah, I think uh, Robert's wanting to be in, in a perfectionist. The answer is HbA1c is all you really need, right? Because as he will tell you, this is a progressive condition. Yeah. The insulin resistance doesn't develop overnight; it develops over 20, 30, 40 years. And so I tell people: measure your HbA1c, and if it's elevated, you already have a problem, but it's a manageable problem. So we would love to see everyone with HbA1c about below five, but that's not going to happen because yeah. so many people are already got damaged carbohydrate metabolism. But a value of five is still astonishing. You'll be very healthy at a value of five. Right. But let's say you have a value of five at 30, but at 40, it's 5.6. Mm. You are just heading for diabetes. Right. You have to now cut the carbs. And you could cut the carbs at a value of 5.6. You will get back to five if you cut the carbs. So you, all you're showing is that you have got insulin resistance. Your carbohydrate metabolism has been abnormal for a period of years, maybe a decade, but as far as we, we know, as long as you get it back down to 5.5 or below, you're probably going to be fine. So he's quite right. Once your HbA1c starts to rise, you've already got damage, but that doesn't matter as far as we know. You can reverse that as long as you don't eat carbohydrates from then on. Gotcha. But what we're doing is we're saying, 
the patient comes in and has got a value of 6.4. Yeah, that's... And he's, the patient says, well, but you're not diabetic because you haven't got a value of 6.5. Yeah. That's... And there's no, you've got no glucose in your urine, so you're not diabetic. You are diabetic. Mm. It's just a matter of time. Mm. So why not start, cut the carb and get your HbA1c down below 5.5? And and all you have to do is cut the carbs. So, so Robert's, of course, correct, but in a practical way, if we were dealing with communities, the HbA1c is a fabulous tool, mm. and we just don't use it properly. What about other tests, um, n- not just in runners, but also other patients with insulin resistance or suspected yeah. insulin resistance even? that, yeah. um, For instance, um, looking at fasting insulin levels, looking at yeah. uh, the euglycemic yeah. clamp, obviously that's more research-based. That's a bit more yeah. in-depth. But yeah. something simple as looking at um, fasting insulin levels and maybe checking for C-protein. Yeah, C-peptide, C-peptide. C-peptide, yeah, yeah that's, that's the key. But, but fasting, your, fasting uh, insulin is absolutely correct. And your value needs to be below about four or five. And, and I was just checking a paper recently that teenagers in America have values of 12. They have fasting insulin of 12. That's oh. average. So that, that tells you what we're dealing with. Yeah. Now, you, you make the point, or we need to make the point, that you could have an HbA1c of, of 4.8, and a fasting insulin of 12, and that would still indicate that you're insulin resistant. Yeah. And that's where Robert would come along right. and say, so you see, the HbA1c is giving you a false security. Mm. My argument would be that, that 12, that fasting insulin of 12, is not right. It's dangerous, but you're still not, frankly, in trouble. Gotcha. It's once the HbA1c starts to rise, that's your next phase. Yeah. So phase one of the disease is your insulin goes up, Phase two is the HbA1c goes up, and phase three is HbA1c goes way up, and you're passing glucose in your urine. So we could get people at phase one if we measured insulin resistance. Sorry, if we measured fasting insulin. Yeah. And in stage phase two, we'll pick them up with HbA1c. But we, as doctors, look at phase three when they pass glucose into the urine. Yeah. And and that's far too late. Well, yeah, they're in the black box there, aren't they? What are, what yeah, about um, accessory weird symptoms, non-specific symptoms, like for instance, tendon pain? Do you ever yeah. use <laughs> this as a key to what's happening? Yeah, I think that that's true. And Jill Cook, who's an Australian researcher, was the first to show that insulin resistance may present as uh, Achilles tendonitis or other conditions. Right. And I had a kidney tendonitis for a long time. Mm. And it was only when I started to manage my diabetes that it went away properly. Oh, right. So she, she's quite right. That's another. The other one, of course, is putting on weight progressively, yep. falling asleep at inappropriate times, and, and anger, and not being able to explain why you suddenly have these anger bursts, outbursts. So those are all other features of developing diabetes. And here's me. I just thought it was a midlife crisis and I needed a flash car. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to ask, what does a typical week on a low carb, high fat diet look like? When I like, I guess in my mind, I, you know, I, I have a hard time getting away from lots of veggies and lovely tomatoes and things like that. Yeah. How do you incorporate that that healthy polyphenol, high polyphenol diet, enough fibre to prevent constipation and look after your bowel so that you don't yeah. get bowel cancer? How do you how do you ratify this with a high fat, low carb diet? Well, if you look at our book, The Real Meal Revolution, you'll see that we have a lot of vegetables in it. It is not a low vegetable diet. In fact, we we there's more fiber in this diet than on a conventional diet. So avocados, for example, are full of fiber. Coconut, for some reason, is the best laxative you will ever eat in your life. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, to me, fiber is not the explanation for why people get constipation or lack of fiber. It's other factors. And in fact, there are good studies showing that to get people to remove their constipation, you cut the fiber. So the theory about fiber is all wrong. And there are no clinical trials ever showing that fiber prevents colon cancer. None at all. Vegetarians, for example, have the same rates of of colon cancer as everyone else. But those are associational studies and they're not, we don't, we don't put too much uh, store on them. But in clinical trials, they've never shown that fiber makes any difference to the presence of colon cancer. Not even resistant so, fibers? Those are all mythologies. Sorry? Not even resistant fibers? Resistant starches? And... Yeah. Really? No, there have been clinical trials in the new, reported in the New England Journal of Medicine 
and they made no difference. So, oh, really? And they looked at, at they looked at cancers and cancers in situ, and they found no difference. But that's never reported because it's so wrong. Right. But but you see, I, I just look at it this way: that humans are are designed. We're not really omnivores. We are carnivores. Mm-hmm. And we have the small colon, and the colon is where you digest cellulose. And we're not really cellulose digesters because we have to have bacteria to make us digest the cellulose. Yeah. So a lot of people, vegetarians, have trouble with their with gut, their gut because they don't have the right bacteria to break down the cellulose, and so they run into trouble. They have gut problems, and the colon of the human is not designed for digesting vegetables. <laughs> what What do you it's say then to for, the what do you say then to the the point that people make about humans being the only animal on earth that don't wean, that we still continue to drink milk past our weaning stage? And putting that into the case, I guess, about um, seeing as we were talking about it, colon cancer prevention, where I do believe there's some association with milk reducing colon cancer. Is that right? Yeah, well, there's, a, there's a group in, in America who look at breast milk, and it's clearly it's got some other special components. And one of the things it does is produce a different microbiome in in children who are fed breast milk versus standard milk. Hmm. And I think that there's there's something in that, that breast milk is very special. And, and, and the problem is why we've downgraded breast milk is because it contains saturated fat. So the Australian dietary guidelines are really interesting. They, they tell you that up to the age of two, you must feed your child saturated fat. Hmm. And then all of a sudden, when it's two years and one day, you must stop eating saturated fat because it's going to get a heart attack. Ah, okay. so it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. You see, there's, there's a complete, because they've got the wrong paradigm, yeah. is that fat causes heart disease. We cut out fat at two years and one day. Whereas before two years, we realize that fat is critically important in the diet. And and the saturated fat, the breast milk is full of saturated fat. But let me just tell you, take a little bit further. Yeah. The the beef that we eat, where do they get their protein from? Because grass doesn't have any protein in it. Yeah. The protein comes from the bacteria in its gut. It right. digests those the bacteria and the protein comes from that. Mm. But but the carbohydrate in the cellulose is converted to saturated fat in the in the rumen of these animals. So the cows or the cattle that you eat, they eat carbohydrate carbohydrate diet, but they convert it into saturated fat. And humans are trying to become the first animals who eat a high carbohydrate diet. But but we aren't designed like that. We 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 come from chimpanzees or we yeah, are a common ancestor with yeah. chimpanzees and they are they eat cellulose and they convert it to saturated fat and that that's the key so we learned it's much easier to kill these animals eat the fat rather than have to carry around this huge gut to convert a really a nutrient poor fruit food mm. sorry mm. nutrient poor grass or whatever mm. uh, to, and, and vegetables to convert that into something we could use as a saturated fat yeah and that's when we became human. So, so the move to tell us we have to eat lots of vegetables, there, there is no scientific basis for that whatsoever. Yeah. It's, again, a, a marketing myth. So with regards to Lauren Cordain, the paleo diet, um, mm. which is you know, a low-carb, high-fat diet, but very high in, in fibers, in, in vegetable matter. Indeed, you know, he's yeah. been lampooned by so many people, but I've spoken to him and he said that they just won't read the book <laughs> if they would only read mm. the book. Indeed, yeah. um, a very well-known chef in Australia, Pete Evans. Hi, Pete. How are you going? Who do I know? You know. Yeah. Oh, well, Pete Evans. I know who, Pete well. Okay, who knows Lauren. Um asked us when we engaged Lauren Cordain to speak at our symposium, asked us if he could make the recipes for the meals along the yeah. paleo guidelines. And when we go out to lunch, there's all of these beautiful long tables of, I won't say nothing, but heavily, heavily weighted towards vegetable matter. It was a vegetarian's yeah. paradise. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. And yes, there was, then there was the meat. So yeah. why are we getting this so wrong? Why no, are there still I'm, people I'm saying, this, yeah. forgive me, why are there still people saying, um, I remember one title, you know, the paleo diet advocates, uh, your ancestors or your microbes really aren't that into you. 
um, saying that we need to eat more plant food. And they said, well, of course, that's what a paleo diet did. They had to catch the, uh, the animal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think we've still got to get through this one. Uh, but vegetables really were only started becoming popular 12,000 years ago you know, with the cereals and grains. Mm. And so they're also a recent development. And we live for a long time without the modern vegetables and the modern cereals and grains. Mm. And we were very healthy. So I have a little bit of a problem. I, I, you know, if people want to eat lots of vegetables, that's fine. And if they can cope with it, that's fine. Yeah. But the evidence that they are critical for our health is simply not there, in my opinion. Right. It's all associational studies. And these associational studies are based on the fact that 40 years ago, people were told to eat cereals and grains and vegetables and to avoid meat. Yeah. And the healthiest people did that. They ran their marathons like I did. And they didn't smoke, and they did everything else right. They didn't indulge in alcohol. They were married. They were the higher socioeconomic class. They had everything going for them. And 40 years later, we found, my gosh, the people who didn't eat meat and had lots of cereals and lots of vegetables live longer. But you don't know whether it was because they just happened to be genetically better and they had all these other factors going for them. Yeah. You can't isolate it to the diet, right. in, as people are trying to do. And, and that's the problem with the associational studies. My only problem with the paleo diet is that that if you're insulin resistant, it's too much carbohydrate. Gotcha. That, that's the key. So I think the paleo diet's really good for the majority of people. If you were raised on that diet from a young age and you didn't eat sugar and you didn't eat refined carbohydrates and you didn't eat cereals and grains and you had lots of vegetables and you could have some fruit, that'd be fine because you wouldn't develop insulin resistance. Yep. But in my case, where I'm already type 2 diabetic and I'm profoundly insulin resistant, the paleo diet will never work because it's got far too much carbohydrate. And that's the only distinction between the two diets, I think. Gotcha. So advice or resources for athletes particularly, I guess, and also for practitioners who are going to be listening to FX Medicine who might not be across how to institute the low-carb, high-fat diet. What do you suggest? Yeah, um, there's a huge bit of evidence or lots of evidence on the on the internet, of course. I would suggest that the one article that you can download from the British Journal of Sports Medicine is our article that's freely downloadable. It explains how the biology of the diet why it works. And that's an article I wrote and Dr. Vint, W-I-N-D-T. So anyone just types in no expense, be British Journal of Sports Medicine, that article will come up and they can download it, print it out for free. Done. We'll put that up on that'll FX Medicine. That would be a good start. Yeah. That would be a good start to explain the biology of the diet and the benefits and why it has unique benefits for people with insulin resistance. Mm-hmm. The, our book, Real Meal Revolution, is available on on Amazon, and that gives you incredible good uh, recipes and some of the science as well. The recipes are just amazing. And that would be that's good for how you prepare foods and what the foods should contain. Mm-hmm. For, for athletes, I think the best writer is Jeff Ehrlich, and he's written The Art and Science of Low-Carbohydrate Performance. That's probably the best book for the athlete who wants to seriously get involved with this diet. So it's Jeff Rolick, The Art and Science of the Low-Carbohydrate Performance. Gotcha. And once you get onto that, once you get into those books, you'll, you'll see there's, there's incredible resources on the internet. One of the best websites is dietdoctor.com. Dietdoctor.com. But anyway, you'll find it. The guy's name is Andreas Ian Felt. E-E-N-F-E-L-D-T. That's, that's probably the best website uh, for, for low carbs. He covers everything. Unreal. And, of course, yeah, there's your it, TED it, Talk. It, yeah, there's a couple of my talks. And the one I gave in Melbourne, actually, that's very popular. I think it's uh, close to 200,000 people have watched it now. And that, that was the low-carb diet. So any, you could type in for, for YouTube to Noak's videos. Yeah. Tim Noakes, I can't thank you enough for taking me through. You've, you've really shaken my tree. I've got to say, you've woken me up to a few <laughs> things that I, I've been looking at myself going, uh-oh, I need to be doing some changes. Uh, stop that <laughs> Stop that cheating on day five. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I can't thank you enough for taking us through. And obviously, you have been upsetting the apple cart 
challenging the status quo for many years and you will continue to do so and I, I can't thank you enough for me and for FX Medicine listeners for, for natural health practitioners around the world wanting to sort of wake people up about the irreverent irrelevant dietary guidelines and where we should be changing them for our patients and indeed yeah, the athletes yeah. that are listening as well thank you so much for joining us yeah. on FX Medicine today my pleasure Andrew thank you for having me and I hope that your audience will appreciate it and hopefully incorporate some of these ideas into their practice oh, they definitely will this is FX Medicine I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook if you're loving our FX Medicine podcasts Please don't forget to share us with your colleagues, family and friends.